Hello, everybody. This is Rick Geiler with Silverside Insurance Marketing here in Arizona. Uh, welcome to today's uh, presentation. I have on the line with me Tony Fiorillo, as usual, to color up some of what he is seeing in current market conditions and trends. Uh, Tony is the principal and founder of Asset Management Strategies in Indianapolis, Indiana. And without further ado, I will get it over to Tony, and he can get, uh, get us some updates on a few of the things we're seeing to kick the year off here. Hey, Tony, uh, thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Rick. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, speaking of the new year, why don't we talk a little bit about the predictions for 2017. It's uh, hard to remember to write that date down this early in the new year, but it's here whether we like it or not. So uh, I get a lot of contacts from clients and, and uh, the agents that I've talked with and also from media requests about quotes for my predictions for this upcoming year. And like a lot of things, I can't give you just a simple answer. I have to give you a little bit more of an uh, expanded explanation for that. What we do with the trend following really doesn't require us to make predictions. And I think when you start making predictions, that's where you, you bump up into really what is called market timing. Most of those predictions come from a foundation in uh, fundamental analysis. And that fundamental analysis could be anything from will the Fed raise interest rates two times this year or will they raise interest rates three times? Will those be a quarter of a percent move each time? Will they be a half a percent move? We can't predict those. Uh, we know that the Fed is probably going to do something, but beyond that, nobody knows. And the market has digested all of that information on both sides of that argument already into the valuations that we're seeing today. So the market generally moves uh, in accordance with things that we can't predict, that we can't see. So we're left to try and figure out some way to ascertain what our expectations are for the, for the upcoming year without making some prediction. Uh, our software doesn't have to make predictions. The model that we use you know, looks at the price movement, and the price movement is pretty simple to follow. If the price is going up, it means more people are buying. If the price is going down, it means more people are selling. It's really just as simple as that. And we can't identify the tops and the bottoms in the markets until they've already hit those tops and bottoms. I don't think it's fair to ask, identify that top. Same on the bottom. You know, when the market hits the bottom and starts moving up, we will identify that, that uh, bottoming effect once it's over. We can't predict when it's going to happen. But it's still a very, very powerful process if we are just a little bit right. If we're a little bit right and we can miss some of the more significant moves in the downside of the market, then we don't have to make that much on the upside before we're uh, well ahead and, and uh, exceeding the benchmarks of what we measure against. So one of the things that people talk about a lot are the S&P 500 PE ratios. I've got a chart up here that shows the 90-year historical chart of the PE ratios. These are the 500 biggest companies in the United States, and it looks at the trailing 12 months uh, earnings that those 500 companies have reported, and then it does a multiple of what the stock market valuation is, the, the S&P valuation is, of those 500 stocks relative to the earnings that those companies have already reported. There's a lot of things that go into projecting what the market might do out in advance, and one of those things is they look at revenues, they look at revenue forecasts, they look at forward-looking PE ratios. Well, those are all very, very difficult to predict. So what we're looking at here is just the absolute factual historical basis of where the S&P 500 has been over the last 90 years. And you can see where we're valued at right now all the way to the right of the chart is looks a little bit high. And you'll hear that from some people saying that the market is a little overvalued, the market is uh, priced very high, the market is overbought. And that's typically the type of rhetoric that you hear when we get that P-E ratio above what its 90-year average has been, which is right in that uh, 16 percent or 16 times range is what the average has been. But you can see some pretty pronounced spikes here. Uh, we had a pretty significant spike here in 2008 where the P-E ratio reached 116 times. But remember what happened in 2009, uh, the following year, the S&P was up 23%. So it doesn't necessarily make a correlation that if the S&P is high, that we're not going to have some good years in the stock market. 
it doesn't necessarily mean that if the S&P ratio is very low, like it was here, uh, you know, in these years where it was in single-digit years or single-digit multiples of the earnings. And you'll see the, the stock market dropped in 73 and 74 uh, by about 50 percent. But it took several years with the single-digit PE ratios before the market started taking off in the early 80s. So just because the ratio was very low, in this case single digits, we didn't have performance in the stock market for six, seven years later. You know, same here in 1990, where we start out in 1990 with a, with a little slightly below average multiple for the market, but it got up here to 25 times in 1992. And if you remember what happened in the late 90s from 95 to, to 1999, the S&P was up over 20% for five consecutive years. That was a record. We'd never done three consecutive years, and we did five consecutive years. Now, the P-E ratio slumped here, so it started out at a much lower point before we had that run-up in, in, uh, into the sell-off in 2000 to 2002. Again, here in 2002, we had a P-E multiple of 44 times but we had a pretty nice recovery in the stock market after 2002. So the P-E ratio could be adjusted because of two main factors. One, the earnings are down. If the earnings are down and the market valuation is still the same, you're going to get a higher multiple uh, just because the earnings are down. If the earnings are the same and the market goes up, you're going to get a higher multiple. So you have to look at the combination of the two. Obviously, here in 2008, where our earnings went to nearly zero for a lot of these companies, we didn't have to have much stock market valuation to get this number up to a ridiculous multiple of 120. But since that time, since 2008, uh, we've had a double-digit average return in the S&P since that time. So it doesn't necessarily mean that if we have high multiples that we can't have a market uh, performance. Now, historically, uh, studies have shown that we don't have any significant uh, bull market runs uh, that start out from a higher multiple. Uh, that could be the case. But again, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to have these extremely low multiples in order to trigger a market run. Uh, another couple ways to look at this, this shows you the yearly numeric number, not on a graph, but you can see in 2008 where this multiple was at 21 times, uh, the market sold off, and then this multiple uh, resulted in uh, a very high number uh, at that time. But if you look back at 2003, where the multiple was at 31 times, we had a pretty significant stock market rally from 2003 into 2008 with those multiples staying at pretty high levels. So there really isn't a, an identifiable correlation of where these numbers have been. Uh, again, here you see the spike on this chart where it shows the multiple getting up over 100 uh, just in that, uh, in that one time period. So bottom line, uh, you know, when people ask me what my prediction for the market is, it really is a little pedestrian and probably not what they want to hear, but my prediction is always basically the same. I don't really know any more than that, and my prediction is that the market is up its average of you know, close to 11% that it's done for the last 90 years. So to know more than that means that we have some insight into the fundamental argument of what is actually going to happen. I don't have that insight, and I don't have models that will tell me that insight. The models that we use only look at that price movement, and the price movement is the definitive end of argument. It doesn't make any difference why or when or how or who's involved. If that price movement is going up, there are more people buying that stock than there are selling. If the price is going down, there are more people selling than there are buying. It's just as simple as that. And our models look at those, at those price movements only, not the fundamental argument of why this may happen or might have happened. It just tells the bottom line story of what's, what's the math. And the math is that price movement. So I know it's disappointing. I wish I could tell you that my crystal ball was just a little bit better polished and you know, that we're going to have a 20 plus percent run up in the market. I have no idea. I think that there are a lot of fundamental factors that can come into play with a new president. Certainly we've seen this optimistic uh, jump in the market. I think uh, some people are calling it the Trump rally. I prefer to call it an optimism rally. I think it could be very, very powerful for our market 
if we got a government that got behind our American businesses instead of continually building roadblocks in front, in front of them. Uh, we've seen examples of how companies can pull back manufacturing jobs here in the United States in the last three to four years. We've been gaining manufacturing jobs. That's the first time that's happened in the last 50 years. As these exported jobs to India and China, Thailand and, and Vietnam, as those labor inequities have, have come back to closer to where our costs are, then the marginal advantages of those lower labor costs go away. So yes, the labor is still cheaper in China and India and Vietnam, but then you still have left to deal with the energy cost and the logistics cost of getting that product back here. So it doesn't take much increase in that labor cost before that marginal advantage goes away, and it's just as easy to, to have that work done here in the United States. And we're starting to see that. So I think those things are very positive. I think if the new administration makes some better trade agreements, uh, I think that would be extremely positive. Uh, I'm concerned that the new administration may go a little bit farther and, and have more of a protectionist uh, type of a stance, which I don't think would be good for our economy. Protectionist stance means that, yes, we may in the short term preserve more jobs, but it means that our standard of living is going to go down because we don't have the ability to buy cheaper goods and services from somewhere else around in the world. And when those goods and services are manufactured somewhere else in the world for a lower cost, that increases our standard of living. We get to buy those things at a lower, a lower price. But it also means that somewhere in the world, there's somebody who's getting a paycheck for the first time. And when they get that paycheck, they have money in their pocket to spend, and we have to compete for where they're going to spend it. And I have faith that the American business and the American people uh, can produce goods and services that are going to be wanted around the world. So we're not afraid to compete with them, but we don't want to kind of protect ourselves from availing the opportunities that we have with those lower cost production capabilities other places in the world. So I think that's a, a key factor to watch. But I think the biggest thing that could drive the stock market significantly higher in 2017 is a reduction in regulation. And that's certainly the, the, the commentary that we're hearing from this you know, newly forming administration. And if they can do a little bit of that, I think that carries a lot of weight because not only does it eliminate some of the regulation, but it makes the whole philosophy more positive. If companies and businesses think that things are going to be better, then they very well might be. And if they feel like there is optimism ahead of them, then they have the courage to go out and hire new people, build more plants, expand, and grow the economy. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, our economy is driven 70% on consumption. So as our people are working, cash and paychecks, buying goods and services, uh, it continues to fuel the economy further and further and further. And mm -hmm. that's important uh, because we are 70% consumption driven. So we can't do this in a vacuum. We have to be able to to buy goods and services, raw materials that we can then manufacture into goods and services that we're going to use here domestically, but also goods and services that we want to export around the world as well. We can't just say we're going to be a, a total exporter and not be willing to, uh, to play fair with some of these companies and be an importer as well. Now, can we make some improvements on the trade agreements? Obviously, I think that's the case, and I hope that, that's, that that happens. But I think that the overall optimism is what we're seeing in the, in the reflection in the stock market valuations at this point, because we've yet to see these significantly higher earnings ratios. The, the ratio is staying at a pretty high level. The earnings have not, the earnings have not quite kicked in yet to justify mm -hmm. higher and higher valuations. But I think that can happen pretty quickly. So where we stand with our model is we don't know, we don't have to know, but our model will tell us. And when those things happen, we will not just sit idly on our hands and tell our clients, don't worry, it'll all come back someday, be patient. We can't ignore the emotions and the fears that, that our clients who are real people that they have. If they're awake at night worrying about their money, it's not going to put them to sleep just to say, uh, don't worry about it, it'll come back. We have mm -hmm. to address that, and I, and I think our model uh, definitely does that. So we don't want to be reactionary. We don't want to sell out too quickly if it's just a, a bump in the road. Uh, we want to stay the course. We'll take some lumps, 
from a valuation standpoint here and there, but we want this process working in the background to protect us from these catastrophic losses. And that's exactly what our model has proven to be able to do. So uh, that's an eight-minute answer to the question of what my prediction is for the year, Rick. I don't know if, if you have any thoughts to add to that. Well, yeah, uh, sitting here in January of 2017 as advisors, when we go out and we talk to our clients, uh, as far as asset allocation, how should I allocate my asset? Obviously, the AMS model looks to minimize the risk, but there's still always going to be risk in, in any kind of variable or, or, or equity-driven product. We haven't seen, even though interest rates, the, the bonds and, and, and the driving forces behind interest rates seem to have moved quite a bit higher in the last couple of months, we haven't really seen CD rates. We haven't really seen fixed annuity rates make a significant move. So as we're going out and talking to our clients with the new year going, asset allocation. Should I maybe look at more fixed products? Should I maybe, well, is, is the upside of the market percentages compared to what my historical risk tolerance should be? What's your take on that? Now, okay, what do we do if we allocate some to fixed income or if we, you know, is now the time to put more money into index annuities? or is now the time to free up money and put it into managed accounts. We would look at that uh, scenario the same every year. Uh, there is a certain amount that you want to have in emergency funds, that you have liquid, that you can walk down to the bank this afternoon and pull money out. There's a certain amount that you want to have in annuities where there's absolutely no headline risk, there's no risk to your principal, uh, and then you want to have some that is allocated to something that's going to perform potentially a little bit better with a uh, logical uh, amount of risk involved, and that's what we do on the portfolio management side. So I wish I could tell you that you know we're adjusting our models and we're reallocating more to to short-term interest rates, or we're reallocating more to to the equity side, but we really don't change that from year to year. Mm -hmm. From that same angle, when you see the valuations, we talked a lot about PE today. When you see the valuations where they are, would you expect that part of the driving force behind that is the low returns that investors can get on fixed vehicles? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, I think when you look at what your opportunity costs are, so you know, you would think that when you're getting a tenth of a percent at the bank, and oh by the way, it's taxable, and oh by the way, it may cause mm -hmm. your Social Security to be taxable, and oh by the way, it may cause your supplement to your Medicare tax to go down, which in effect uh, decreases your Social Security check, mm -hmm. even though those interest rates are so low, uh, you would think that people would look at the market and say, well, I really don't care what the, what the valuation is. I'm getting a dividend yield of 1.7, 1.8% on the S&P. That's a heck of a lot better return than I'm getting in cash, but there's a different risk level. You know, in cash, you can't lose your principal. In the stock market, you can have a significant adjustment to your principal. More than likely, you're not going to lose 100% of your principal in the stock market. If we get to that point, we've got much bigger problems in front of us mm -hmm. than money. You know, at that point, we're in a Smith & Wesson world where the only things that matter are, are water, food, and ammunition. But, you know, I hear from people all the time that say that if I put money in, in the stock market, I can lose it all. Uh, there are ways that you can bet everything in the in the stock market. You can buy futures or options that could potentially be worthless. We don't do that. We don't recommend to clients that they do that. But if you buy the uh, shares of the 500 biggest companies in this country, for those valuations to go to zero means that we are in complete Armageddon. There is no law. There is no agreement on an exchange system. Uh, it's every man for himself, and I don't think that we're going to get there. Mm. So, but but it's you know it's bizarre. I hear this from people I've heard it for years and years and years that they say if I put money in the stock market, I could lose every dime I've got. We don't we don't work in the way that that you're right. betting and the leverage it would take to to do that. Correct. Yeah. Right. You know another phenomenon that I've heard from people. I remember back in 2000 to 2002 where account valuations were down, and this is before we were using the model that we were using. Uh, we were buy and hold people, and, and our message was, don't worry, the markets will come back, which they'd always done. You always had these 30 or 35 year periods where the markets went up, and then 
they had this adjustment. It was painful, you didn't like it, but it was understandable. And so we told people, don't worry, you know, we're going to rebalance, we're going to uh, stay the course, and the markets will come back. And they did um, until 2008, where you had another horrific sell-off, and it wasn't separated by this exaggerated run-up in valuation, and it wasn't separated by 35 years of increase in the stock mm -hmm. market. It was five years after the last sell-off. Yeah, and I think that the fact that we've had two extremely dramatic sell-offs in the last, what, 15 years puts it more in the forefront of people's minds that those things are possible, as opposed to, you know, you had that long bear market in the in the 60s going into the 70s, but then you, you didn't have any dramatic sell-offs in that by the standards we saw in 2002 or 2008 and 2009. That's right. Yeah, I mean, we had the... The uh, Black Monday, October of 2000 or uh, 1987, where we had such a you know dramatic sell-off in the market. But what people forget is that even with that dramatic sell-off in October of 1987, for the calendar year, the stock market was still mm -hmm. positive. Yep. So it, it was a painful sell-off, but it was very short and it repaired very quickly. So these bear markets that we've had from you know 1929 to 1933. Uh, 1973, 1974, 2000 to 2002, and then in 2008, where we had these horrible sell-offs. 50, 45, 50 percent of the market values, valuations evaporated in those time periods. We can't ignore that. We can't tell people that, well, it's not likely to happen again. Uh, it's a scary world out there. There's a lot of things that can go very, very wrong very, very quickly. And But at the same time, I don't agree with the $13 trillion of money that's sitting on the sideline making next to nothing. You know, that's a historical number that we have never seen before. $13 trillion of money that's just parked in short-term safe, making next to nothing in return uh, money. What are they waiting for? Are they right. waiting for interest rates to come back up? Because, you know, we can see increases in the interest rates that may not reflect increases in CD rates. We could see... Uh, increases in the interest rates that increase the mortgage interest rate, which directly slows down the economy. If less people are buying housing, if less people employed in housing, 25% of our economy is tied to housing. So the government can slow down the economy very quickly by raising interest rates, especially if that results in, in an increase to mortgage rates. But you know, if they're waiting for the good old days, like the early 80s, where we've got 12 15% CD rates, I don't think we will, I'm not sure that we will ever see that again because of the tools that we now have to manipulate the, the economy. We look at how mismanaged those have been through some of the crises that we've seen, especially in 2008, you know, the, the TARP uh, project, the, uh, the funding, you know, the bailout system, you know, where they mm -hmm. bailed out the um, different industries, especially the financial sector. So you may look at that and say that it didn't work, but you don't know because you don't know how bad it could have been if they didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think it's pretty fair to say that the, the, the TARP uh, project was a disaster. It did not do what it was intended to do. Uh, but the one thing that it may have accomplished was it may have given some peace of mind. And I can remember in the fall of 2008 that uh, it was as scary a, a time as I've ever seen. I don't know how close we were to a complete financial system shutdown, but I would bet we have never been closer. And if the difference between everybody walking out of their job and going to their bank and taking every penny out of the bank that day was the government stepping in with this TARP program, then it was successful. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that might be the case that that it was a little bit of window dressing that it was you know a placebo that that made investors calmer and and stopped the panic. So in that effect, it was successful. If you look at the ap actual details of the implementation of it, uh, it was a disaster. So did it work or did it not work? You know, it depends on which definition you look right. at. So right. you know, we have the tools now, and we we have enormous amounts of government debt that the government has a huge incentive not to let these interest rates get too high because they couldn't afford to pay the interest on the debt that they carry right now. Mm -hmm. So to the point that they can manipulate interest rates, they very much have an incentive to keep them lower. Now what traditionally the Fed has done in raising interest rates 
is look at inflation and look at runaway growth in the economy. Well, we haven't had inflation uh, to, to pull back the reins, uh, and we haven't had a runaway growth in the economy. We may be seeing the beginnings of a runaway growth in the economy if we can remove some of the regulations, free up these companies to really, to really move forward. That could be a very, very powerful thing. And if that happens, then interlocked as the global world is now, then things get better everywhere in the world. If our economy improves, China's economy improves, India's economy improves, uh, Eastern or Western Europe's economy approve, improves. It's all interlocked now. So what we used to see is these dissimilar price movements between these different asset classes. We could say, well, we, we'll allocate some to Europe. We'll allocate some to fixed income. We'll allocate some to this asset class or that asset class because traditionally they've had these dissimilar price movements, and that gives us our protection. We don't have that anymore. We have, as they say, when the, when the, uh, when the tide goes out, all the boats in the harbor go down. Mm -hmm. So it didn't make any difference whether there were two boats or whether there's 3,000 boats. They all go up and they all go down. And we're seeing that more and more with this interlocked, connected global economy and the capital structures that support those global economies. So, you know, what happens in Hong Kong this morning, uh, we wake up and see the effects of that in London first thing. Then it happens in our market. At the end of the day, Hong Kong, is, it's, there are differences and there are different challenges that the different these face, different interest rates, different capital structures, different funding that's available to them. So it's not perfectly in lockstep, but it also means that we shouldn't have these uh, horrific meltdowns. That if we can stop some of these meltdowns or minimize these meltdowns, then I think that, that the tools are working. So I think that's what we have with the Fed. And we can criticize the moves that they make when they make them. But at the end of the day, we have pretty effective tools to keep the economy where we want it. And part of that is keeping interest rates where we want them. So can't say that I think interest rates are going to increase dramatically and that people are going to be rewarded for waiting, be able to put money in the bank and get 6 8% with no risk. I, I just don't see that happening for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe never. At least not for the... Not for a very long period, uh, which those, those huge spikes we saw in the early 80s, refresh my memory, the, how long did those last? Yeah, they, well, you had a residual effect of interest rates building mm -hmm. up in the, in, in the late 70s and then in the early 80s where money market rates were paying 15%. Mm -hmm. I can remember in the early 80s having conversations with clients to, when I recommended that they buy a government-guaranteed bond that had a 30-year term to it that was paying 18%. Wow. And most of them said no, because what if interest rates go up? So, you know, we are our own worst enemy very often, that's for sure. But certainly in retrospect, since that time in the early 80s, interest rates have fundamentally done nothing but come down. So mm -hmm. we had, you know, we didn't have 18% 30-year Treasury yields for very long. That started to decline in the mid-80s but still had 6%, 8% into the 90s. So I think the worst of it was kind of lopped off there in the 80s, but you still had some residual effect of those higher interest rates even in the, in the last couple of years here. I remember thinking that this is a new world, that when interest rates got to double digits, that this is just the way it's going to be. Mortgage rates, 18%. Can you imagine signing a mortgage for 18% interest for 30 years, and how much reduced buying power you had because of the cash flow it cost to fund an 18% mortgage. You could buy significantly less house, or the value of the house was going to have to be lowered. But I remember people thinking that this was the new norm, that this was the way things were always going to be. And I remember looking back in history and reminding people that we had had double-digit spikes in interest rates a couple times before in the history of this country. Uh, most notably back in the late 18th century, uh, where interest rates got to double digits and then they came back down. So you came out of a period from you know the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, and 60s where interest rates might have been 3% for decades, decades where they didn't change. That I don't know that we'll see again. You know, I just don't know that 
that uh, we're going to have that stubborn determination by the Fed that's going to last for decades in, in their resolve. I think that they're going to want to react and tweak things quicker than, than decades. But as you've seen in the last 15 years, the movements that the Fed has made in interest rates have really not been all that dramatic. So yes, they will make changes, but they're not going to make any uh, significant knee-jerk reactions that are going to disrupt the economy or disrupt the status quo. But to whatever extent they have the ability to control the interest rates, they certainly have the incentive to do that and keep those rates low. Somewhat at cross purposes, if they want the economy to grow, we need interest rates to be low. If we want to keep inflation from coming in, we need interest rates to be a little bit higher. But if they let rate interest rates get too high, then the cost to the government for the debt that they have gets higher and higher. So they've got to balance that, and it's a, it's a constant challenge to keep it within balance. There's a 20-minute answer to your simple question. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, that's great. Uh, thanks for all that info, Tony. And yeah, 20-minute answer it was good information. Uh, and as far as what what folks out there can do, if you're not already involved in the integrated program with Silverside and AMS, go ahead and give us a call today. If you have gotten involved, but you need to take it to the next step, or you need to know more information, go ahead and get with us. Uh, we can get you on Tony's calendar to work one-on-one -on -one with him, or we can get you whatever information we have uh, in-house here. And then, of course, for all your annuity and life needs, uh, we can price out. We have uh, multiple options from virtually every mainstream carrier on the market we work with. So go ahead and give us a buzz today. Thank you so much for being with us, Tony. And uh, My pleasure. We'll be back Thanks, Rick. Again. We'll be back again uh, few weeks here with an outlook and we can, can take it from there and see see what Tony's crystal ball may be telling him at that point. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. Okay. Take care everybody.